Welcome to, to das, today's last session in this track. It's by Kai Kotovic, Architecting Apollo, Systems Designs Lessons from the Golden Age of Space Flight. Please uh, welcome the speaker. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Kyle Kotowick, and I am here to talk to you, as introduced, about the Apollo program and lessons we can learn from the space race. As you can tell from the video, I like rockets and I like space. Uh, I actually did my PhD at MIT uh, in aeronautics and astronautics, aircraft and spacecraft, uh, where I focused on human systems integration. So how we design technological systems so that humans can work with them without breaking the systems or breaking themselves along the way. And after I finished that, I moved back to Canada, uh, to Ottawa, which is the national capital of Canada, where I started my own company called Invictum Labs. And we focus on a lot of uh, cloud architecture, um, some human factors, uh, Internet of Things, security, all the new hip stuff that all the companies and governments are moving towards. And we're going to start off, we're going to launch into this by talking about the space race in five minutes, a quick review. The space race, of course, between the Soviet Union and America after World War II. So a bit of history. 1945, the Allies defeat the Nazis in World War II, victory in Europe. And after this, they started what they called Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was an effort to take a bunch of the Nazi scientists who'd made some serious advancements and bring them to America to work for the American government. One of them was Dr. Werner von Braun, who you can see here, uh, he was a member of the SS, and here he is with some of his colleagues. But he is most well known for building the V2 rocket. And all the German speakers in this room, which is most of you because I'm in Berlin, uh, can correct my pronunciation. But uh, some not so fun facts V2 stands for Ver Vergeltungswaffen, uh, vengeance weapon. And these things killed 9,000 civilians in Allied countries during the war, and uh, 12,000 people died in labor camps trying to build them. So von Braun, colorful background, not the greatest character to be immigrating to the US after the war. But the Americans said, rockets are cool. We want some rockets. We don't know how to build our own. So come on over. We'll overlook your past transgressions, and you can work for us. And he did. He accepted their offer, and he was pretty high up. He led the American rocket development program. And here you can see him with JFK on the right, himself in the center. And that's uh, Robert Siemens on the left, who was the deputy director of NASA for the Apollo program. 
So the space race kicks off with the Soviets launching their Sputnik rocket with their Sputnik 1 satellite, uh, October 4th, 1957. This is where the Americans realize that maybe they need to get into the game and bring things up to speed. The Soviets then launch some other things into space, like animals. They wanted to demonstrate that things can survive in space. And they do. This is Leica. Leica was the first animal launched into space. The, the Americans developed their uh, Mercury and, sorry, the Redstone rocket, which you can see here, and they start launching some of their own things into space, starting with Explorer 1, the first American satellite, and uh, Miss Baker, the first American animal in space. And then the real trigger point happens. The Soviets launch Yuri Gagarin into orbit, the first human to orbit the Earth, April, sec April 12, 1961. And this is really the turning point in the space race, because America starts to get a little afraid here that um, not just the politicians, but the population starts to become a little concerned that they are so far behind in this new field of technology and what the Soviets might do with these fancy new rockets. So 1962, JFK gives his famous speech at Rice University uh, saying that they will go to the moon by the end of this decade, in an accent that I cannot reproduce. Uh, but it's an important speech. It galvanizes the population, the scientists, the government, and they realize that their timetables are going to be moved up a little bit. So each side starts building some bigger rockets. Uh, America starts building their uh, Mercury capsule on the left and their Atlas D on the right. Soviets developed the Voskhod rocket, which they use for a number of their flights. Uh, the Americans developed the Titan II, uh, which is used for the Gemini program. And the Gemini program is going to come up a couple times. It was a program that was intended to practice skills and test technologies that would be needed for the Apollo program. And the Soviets developed the N1, which was a very interesting rocket that would have been very cool if it didn't explode spectacularly every time they tried to launch it. Eventually, they gave up. And the Americans developed their Saturn V, which was kind of the pivotal rocket for this era because it had a phenomenal track record of success and did everything it needed to for the Apollo program. Apollo 11, July 20th, 1969, the conclusion of the space race as we know it when Americans set foot on the moon for the first time. And this is pretty interesting from a political and socionomical perspective, but more so from a technological standpoint, the time scale at which these things happen. In 25 years, from 1944 to 1969, we went from barely able to launch a rocket over the English Channel to landing people on the moon. And that kind of time scale is unparalleled in other advancements. It really was the golden age of spaceflight in terms of how fast these things progressed. And to give you some comparisons, if we look at modern, modern programs, this is the SLS, the Space Launch System, worked on by NASA and their subcontractors. Uh, this rocket's been in development for over 12 years. It uses a lot of reused parts from the shuttle program, and they've only had one test launch, and it's going to be another year and a half before they launch people on it. And NASA recently announced that it's probably going to be too expensive to use anyways. Virgin Galactic took 19 years of development just to get this thing in the air. Blue Origin's been in operation for 23 years, and they're still launching this with a couple people to suborbital flights, and that's about it. And we can't um, go after them too hard because NASA had a bit more to work with, right? During the space race, they had 4.5% of the federal budget of the US compared to 0.5% now. So they're working with nine times the amount of money that we give them now. So of course, things are going to move a little faster. But they also had the advantage of the progression from analog to digital. We can see here on the left the Mercury capsule, 1961. This thing, uh, entirely mechanical, right? All these throttles and control sticks are all mechanically linked to actuators and valves. All the displays are entirely analog. And on the right, we have the lunar excursion module, or the lunar lander. And it's entirely fly-by-wire. Everything is digital, sent to a control computer, which then actuates the thrusters and um, works accordingly. And a lot of your displays are digital as well. So much of this progress that we see during this era was due to the advent of computer technology. And when we talk about computer technology, we have to always talk about uh, Margaret Hamilton, who was the first programmer hired for the Apollo program uh, in 1965, and she became the director of the software engineering division. She actually coined the term software engineering. Uh, up until that point, it had never been used. She decided that software, a new thing, was important enough and serious enough it needed to be its own discipline, and all the other engineers gave her a very hard time for a while until they realized just how important what she was doing actually was. So she worked on the Apollo guidance computer, uh, which is this cutting edge device uh, on the left here is the guidance computer. And on the right, it was called the DISCI, the display and keyboard unit, uh, which was a novel cutting edge user interface, uh, which is the first time humans could really interact with a computer without needing punch cards or other big uh, mechanical devices. So inside that 
control computer, we have what's called core rope memory. And this is pretty interesting. Uh, it's a read-only memory where the data is actually sewn into the device using uh, wire rope that is uh, sewn through loops. And it had 18 times the memory density of the leading competitor at the time, which was uh, magnetic core memory. And even at 18 times the memory density, it had 2.5 megabytes per meter cubed of memory, uh, which is not a lot compared to today's standards. And it was very labor intensive to create. People actually had to sew it in factories uh, following a schematic that corresponded to the software and thread it back and forth. And it gained the nickname LOL memory, LOL being short for little old lady, uh, because in order to make this, you had to be good at sewing. And the people who were good at sewing just happened to fall into that demographic. So NASA took a bunch of uh, retired women and brought them into factories to write space software, uh, which was a pretty interesting change of pace for them. So after that, the uh, Soviets developed the Soyuz rocket and some capsules still in use today. The Americans developed their space shuttle with a lot of innovations, a lot of flaws, but also uh, some interesting designs. Very shortly after, the Soviets come out with their own unique, entirely different shuttle, which has nothing similar about it. <laughs> this thing actually flew once. It's called the Buran spacecraft, and it flew one time in 1988. It was actually successful. It was uncrewed. Uh, it didn't fly again because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it lost all of its funding. But that first flight actually has the distinction of being the first space plane to fly an entire flight, including a landing, autonomously, with no humans controlling it. And then the Americans build their SLS, which is a doomed project, we'll say, at this point, given the costs and the commercial competition. Uh, but their intention with this is that they're going to launch humans back to the moon by 2024 and then use it as a stepping stone to uh, further places in our solar system. So when we talk about aerospace uh, we, and, and problems with it, we need to think about Murphy's Law, something I think most people are familiar with. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, which of course is not great when you're working with life-critical systems in the air or in space. And this is kind of neat because this was actually said by Edward A. Murphy Jr., who was a pilot in World War II, and then he went to work for the U.S. Air Force where he worked on rocket sleds. And if you're curious what a rocket sled is, it looks like this. It is a sled that slides on tracks and has a bunch of solid rocket motors strapped to the back of it. There are 12 of them on this one. The increased knowledge led to expanded research efforts. Air Force sleds raced at speeds never before achieved to learn more about man's reactions to the conditions he may find at the edge of space and beyond. this thing hit the water at the end there, it reached negative 42 Gs of deceleration. If you know anything about G-force, um, you can imagine there were some very interesting effects on the human body at those decelerations. Um, eyes popping out and a lot of hemorrhaging of various sorts. But as ridiculous as this kind of testing seems, it was actually instrumental in helping them understand how humans and technology would react to those kinds of G-forces during space flights. So what happened here is, during one of these tests, uh, they didn't collect the data that they expected. They had an issue. So they brought Murphy out to examine it, because he was the engineer who kind of designed part of it. And there are various reports on what he said at the time. But he found that one of the technicians had installed a number of the sensors backwards. And that's why they hadn't collected any data. So according to Murphy's son, what he said was, if there's more than one way to do a job, and one of those ways will result in disaster, then somebody will do it that way. According to some of the engineers who were present at the time, what he said was, if that guy, referring specifically to the technician who did it the wrong way, has any way of making a mistake, he will, which is a less polite phrasing, I think. Uh, but we're not exactly sure exactly what was said, but of course, uh, we had Murphy to ask himself, and what he said he meant was that humans make mistakes. And it doesn't matter what kind of technology or training you give them, eventually they will screw something up and cause something to break. And we can see that playing out in a near disaster uh, of Apollo 13. Sorry, Apollo 8. My Roman numerals messed up. Uh, December of 1968. So this was the first flight around the moon, right? They were supposed to orbit the moon to practice skills for the lunar landing several missions later. So we have Margaret again, who is developing a lot of software for this mission. And Margaret had a daughter whose name was Lauren. Margaret worked at the instrumentation lab at MIT, 
And when she was working late nights there, she would bring Lauren with her to play in the lab on the simulator while she did her work. Now, while she, that was happening, Lauren was playing with a simulator and managed to enter a program into the disk key, P01. P01 is a program that is only supposed to be run in the pre-launch phase. So before the spacecraft takes off, they use this to do something. And Lauren managed to enter that while the simulator was in flight between Earth and the moon. It crashed the computer. It wiped the memory cores, everything gone, and it crashed the simulator. Now, Margaret said, that shouldn't happen, so I want to add some software in there that prevents them from entering codes that shouldn't be used at any given time. And NASA says, no, we're not going to allow that. It's going to take too long. It's too expensive. And remember that to make changes, we have to actually sew that into the wire ropes so that you know, there's no quick patch here. There's no quick PR to fix the bug. So they say no, and it doesn't matter anyways, because astronauts are trained to be perfect. They don't make mistakes. They spend their entire careers training for things like this, so how could that possibly happen? And that's foreshadowing. So this is the crew of Apollo 8. Uh, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, Bill Anders. Jim Lovell's a name that you'll hear a couple times tonight. But during their flight from Earth to the moon, uh, Jim is working with the computer, and he manages to enter program P01. Same one Lauren did. It wipes the computer. The computer had, was storing a lot of trajectory data that it was using for navigational calculations, right? everything it needed to loop around the moon and come back to Earth. That is now gone. So they spent eight hours getting that data from mission control over the radio and then manually typing it into that disk to enter it back into the computer. It worked. They survived. They made it back to Earth without issue. But they spent eight hours in a mission that was already jam-packed with other objectives and critical operations. And it was a pretty big deal. So after this, NASA says, yes, Margaret, you can now add this code that prevents this from happening. So that brings us to lesson one, which is that humans make mistakes. And it doesn't matter how well you train them, it will eventually happen, and you cannot bank on it not happening. And if you've been to some of the other conferences in the area that I've spoken at, this is a talk that I give uh, on the Boeing 737 MAX. And it's specifically about human factors and complex systems, and how Boeing's assumptions about how humans would react in critical situations, uh, and how that was different from what humans actually did in those situations, was one of the key factors in those crashes that killed over 300 people. So it's pretty important. But we can also look at another side of it. And this is Apollo 13, uh, a flight that you may know a little bit about if you saw a movie with Tom Hanks which was surprisingly accurate and recommended. But during their flight from Earth to the Moon, they, there was an issue when they were stirring the oxygen tanks to keep the oxygen from separating into layers because it's very cold. There was a wire with some exposed insulation that caused a spark. It ignited the oxygen and the material around it and caused an explosion, which blew all of their oxygen out into space. Pretty big deal, given you need oxygen in space. So what they did is they said, OK, we're not going to land on the moon. We're going to cancel that part of the mission. We're instead going to use the lunar lander systems as a lifeboat for us to provide the oxygen that we need. The problem there was that you don't just need oxygen. You need to remove carbon dioxide. And the system in the command module, while it wasn't broken, did not have enough um, scrubber modules to be able to um, actually do this for so many astronauts for that duration. So they had to build this adapter to be able to use the LEM systems. And it took quite a bit of uh, creative hacking to be able to get this together with duct tape, but it worked. They made it back to Earth. They survived. They were pretty upset they didn't get to land on the moon, but they were alive. And that brings us to lesson 1.1, which is that humans can fix things. When automation breaks, which it always does eventually, humans are a great stopgap to be able to deal with that and recover. And so that brings us to a decision that we have to make on the level of automation that we want to use. And there are many different levels and um, different scales that you'll hear in different publications, but I've kind of distilled it into five that I think are the core ones. Your first level being no automation at all. Right? Your system doesn't do anything for you. It's all manual. Your second level being a system that provides helpful information to support the human. Right? So Google Maps is a good example here. It's not doing anything for you, but it is helping you do what you want to do. Your third level being automatic control when directed by the human. Cruise control being a good example because you turn it on, you turn it off, it automates when you want it to. Fourth being automatic control unless stopped by the human. Automatic update services. They will do their thing, they will restart your computer in the middle of your work unless you intervene to stop them from doing so. 
and then level five being automatic control with no human override. And that's pretty rare to see on Earth because almost every system, particularly dangerous ones, have a big red emergency stop button that we can press. But we see this sometimes in, in distant spacecraft where the latency is so high that there's no way a human could possibly intervene. Uh, New Horizons is a great example, the probe that captured photos of Pluto, because that entire process was entirely automated and once it started, there was no way for a human to intervene to stop it. And how we choose this is a good question, and it comes up fairly often, particularly in the modern era of self-driving cars. What is the appropriate level for a system like that, that is life critical, that can hurt you or people around you, but you want it to be fully autonomous? You need your human to observe so that they know when to intervene, right? Keep, make them keep their hands on the steering wheel. We know that doesn't work. So it's a difficult question. But now we're gonna talk a little bit about software, specifically. So Apollo 11, that first landing on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin. Michael Collins in the middle there. He stayed in the command module while the other two went down to the lunar surface. So they launch, they get to the moon, everything's going great, and they're on their way down to the lunar surface. This is taken from the command module. That's the lunar lander right there. So like I said, their mission, of course, is to land on the moon. And we need to keep in mind that during their training, astronauts go through every conceivable scenario that the evaluators can throw at them. Every error code, every hardware failure, everything that can happen so that they know if something occurs, do I, can I continue? Do I need to do something about it? Do I have to abort and go back up to the command module and go home? During this landing, something happened that they had never seen before. Uh, that's confirmative. Okay. Looking good to us, over. 1202 alarm occurs, they don't recognize it. They don't know what it is, and they don't know what they should do about it. So they ask ground control, uh, and they take a while to get back to them. So Armstrong there is getting a little anxious about hearing that response and what he should do about it. And it didn't just happen once. If we look at a timeline of it, we can see that that alarm in a similar 1201 occurred five times throughout that landing. And each time it was dealt with, and they didn't have to do anything, it just recovered, and they continued. Now, to understand what this actually means, we have to understand the architecture of the Apollo guidance computer. So it has seven different core sets, which are essentially memory banks. Each core set has 12 words of memory, and a word in Apollo was 16 bits, which is 15 data bits and one parity bit. So each core set can hold one software job that needs to be run. And each job has a priority, where a higher value is a higher priority. So when a new job comes along, there's this process running in the background called the executive. It's like a main thread. It just supervises and makes sure everything runs properly. And it calls a function called next core, which does exactly that. It finds the next available core that can be used to slot that job into. And then it does that. It loads that job into the core. And then if its priority value is higher than the current job, it does an interrupt and it switches focus and does the new job instead. Now, a 1202 is what happens when the next core function can't find a new core set that's available. If they're all full, it throws that error. And we can see that in the code. This is actually from a project called the Virtual AGC, which is an open source project on GitHub where they took all of the Apollo code from the physical books and transcribed it into a digital version, and they built an emulator that can actually run it. So it's pretty fun to play with if you're have some time. But we can see that it's checking for a core set, and if it can't find one, it runs this bailout function and then loads this 1202 error code into a register that can be displayed on the disk key to the astronauts. And those are on pages 1,107 and 1,384 of your code books if you need to look them up. So what was actually happening here? Well, this was never supposed to occur because the engineers thoroughly tested everything. They said there's no possible way that you can have more jobs that need to run than you have core sets at any given time. And that is why it never came up during the simulations because they could not force this error to occur because it was theoretically impossible. But it was actually a hardware glitch. So we have this cool thing called a rendezvous radar, which is designed to track the command module so that when you need to go back to it, after you take off from the surface, you can rendezvous with it. And it has this device called an angle resolver, which measures the angle that the radar is pointing at, which is connected to a coupling data unit, which takes the current angle and the desired angle, computes the difference, and if there 
if it needs to be moved, it will send a job to the computer saying, adjust the radar by this many degrees. The problem here was that it was actually with the power supply. There were two power supplies that were out of phase uh, that had never been initiated in the exact amount of phase difference. And uh, it caused the coupling data unit to think that it was in a different position than it actually was. So it kept sending jobs nonstop saying, adjust the radar, adjust the radar at 6,400 jobs per second, which is a lot for that era. So all these core sets were loaded with those jobs that didn't need to be run, but they were there. And so the next core function couldn't find a slot, and it restarted the computer. But what was great about this design and made it succeed is that when it restarted, it kept those jobs in memory in the core sets, but it dropped the lowest priority jobs. It just deleted them and said, you're low priority. We don't need you right now. And that freed up a couple core sets every time it rebooted. So that allowed those new jobs to be slotted in, which is why I could continue running, even though it had to reset five times. And so that brings us to lesson two, which is to prioritize our tasks. The only reason this mission succeeded was because it was able to do that. And there are a lot of examples where that did not work out that well. And I'll show you one later. But what's kind of neat is that this is applies to everything we work on. Uh, you can actually do this, or this is supported natively in Linux. Uh, if you've ever seen this PR column before, that stands for priority. And that actually shows the priority of the different processes and how the scheduler allocates them time. But what if we want to do this in our own software, right? So not different processes, but like different threads in our program. And we can actually do that. And I've shown you a little example in C++ here, where we have a function called func that just burns a bunch of cycles before it spits something out. And we're going to start two of those in two different threads and wait for them to finish. And if we emulate a single core machine using CPU affiliation or actually running it on a single core machine, because if you do it on multiple cores, they'll run in parallel regardless, we can see that this does kind of what we expect. It alternates between the two. Because what it's do the scheduler is doing is because of the same priority, it's doing some of foo, some of bar, some of foo, some of bar, and going back and forth until they're both done. Both done. But what if foo is more important to me, and I need to make sure that it gets done first when it needs to run? The way that you do this differs from language to language and between different architectures, but it's pretty simple in most cases. And you can simply set the priority for that thread. And in this case, if I give foo the higher priority of eight and I run this again, now it does all of foo first before it does bar. So the scheduler no longer switches between the two. It always chooses the higher priority option. The other lesson that we take away from the Apollo design was the idea of persistence of memory, of pers persistence of data. And for anyone here who's worked on an embedded system, think of the last one you worked on. If you restarted it, how often would it come back like this versus coming back like this? I don't, it's a rhetorical question, right? I know the answer. <laughs> I've worked on these systems. Uh, it doesn't happen, right? It's not really something we think about. And there are workarounds. You can dump it to EEPROM and load it when you restart, or some other, try to, um, some other way to try to get it back into memory if you have a failure. But that takes time. It takes coding effort. It's a thing that a lot of situations don't do. But this is another essential aspect of the Apollo computer that allowed it to succeed in those failures. So lesson three is to persist your important data. And I can show you what happens if you don't, especially in aerospace. This is Ariane 5, flight 501. Uh, it was a test flight, but it had a real payload. Uh, it was 1996. Partway through flight, it takes a hard right and explodes. Now, there's no people on here, just a satellite, an expensive satellite, but a satellite that is now distributed all over the land below. This rocket was the pride and joy of the European Space Agency. It was their brand new design that they were very proud of and happy to test. What happened? So it turns out that they copied some code from the Ariane 4 systems into Ariane 5. And part of that code was a function that did something like this. It took a 64-bit float and converted it to a 16-bit signed integer without any checks or balances. That wasn't a problem in Ariane 4 because what it was in relation to didn't ever exceed that 16-bit limit. So this issue never occurred. But once they applied it to the Ariane 5, where forces and accelerations were different, it overflowed, which led to a hardware exception. A hardware exception in the way this computer was designed caused the processor to shut itself down and to fail over to a backup computer. The problem was the backup computer was the same computer with the same code and had the same issue, and it shut itself down as well. Obviously, this is not some great code, which is why I've termed it boom. But that's not the only issue here. 
According to the inquiry board, it wasn't just that, but the decision that you could not restart the CPUs, restart the processors uh, in the event of a failure. Because doing so, was, it made it too difficult to try to recalculate all that trajectory data, and so they couldn't restart them, and therefore, when they both failed, the navigation system was useless. Being able to restart and recover from a failure is absolutely essential in these kinds of systems. So we're going to go back in time a little bit and talk about Gemini 8. Now, the Gemini program, as I mentioned, was a program that was designed to test and evaluate various skills and abilities uh, in preparation for Apollo. So Gemini 8, their mission was to uh, rendezvous two vessels in orbit and then dock them together. So for our crew, we have Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott. Now, a little fun story about Dave Scott. Uh, when I started at MIT, my first month there, my PhD advisor at the time was Jeff Hoffman, who was a shuttle astronaut. And he took me out for lunch and some beers with Dave Scott. And while I'm sitting there, these two are talking to each other and arguing about which of them is more of a real astronaut. Um, jokingly, but also not really jokingly. Uh, and so Jeff's position is, well, you have to fly in space five times to be a real astronaut. And Dave says, no, you have to drive a car on the moon to be a real astronaut. So the Agena target vehicle, which is what they're trying to dock to, it launches. Gemini 8 launches an hour and 41 minutes later, and they rendezvous in orbit. Everything goes according to plan. This is a view out of the Gemini capsule window. And they managed to dock these two spacecraft together. Now, this was supposed to be the hardest part of the mission. It went fine, so things were going pretty well. But shortly after they docked, they noticed that they started spinning. That's the Earth flying by in the window, by the way. So they're moving pretty quick. Now, they thought that this was probably due to an issue with the Agena command module because they were not providing any control inputs on their side, so it wasn't a problem with their capsule. So what they do is they decide to undock from Agena so that they can recover their own capsule. But you'll notice that as they undock, things suddenly start spinning a little bit faster. And that's because the issue was not actually on Agena. It was on their own capsule. So these capsules have what's called an orbital attitude and maneuvering system. And it's a bunch of thrusters around the side that are used to move and rotate in space. Now, this system had one of those thrusters stick in the open position. And it caused it to thrust continuously, causing it to rotate. And once they undocked from Agena, they had less mass, so it started to accelerate faster. They managed to find the issue through some debugging trial and error, and they pulled the circuit breaker for the valve that controlled that thruster, and it shut down, and they were able to recover it using a different maneuvering system. And they splashed down. They were safe. The mission was deemed a failure because they did not accomplish their objective of safely docking, uh, but they survived, which again is the important part. And this brings us to a discussion of failure modes and how we choose them for our systems. There are four different kinds of failure modes that I think I like to talk about. Uh, the first one being fail open, fail closed, fail over, and fail safe. And we're going to talk a little bit about each one to really understand what they mean. So a fail open system, as a physical example, is something that when it fails, it acts as if it isn't even there. A fire sprinkler is a great example, because if that fails, if you break that vial, um, when I was in university, someone hung their skateboard on it and smashed it open, it acts as if the valve isn't even there. The water comes out free-flowing. In the software world, an example that I use is, this is Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Registry. It's like Docker Registry, but on AWS. And you can push images to it, and when you do, it scans them for vulnerabilities. But Amazon is horrible for keeping their things up to date, and it's quite frequent that a new version of Alpine or Python or something will not be supported, and so you'll get this message saying your image is not supported. With this system, you can set up quarantine rules that say if you find a vulnerability, then don't allow this container to be used, don't allow it to go to prod, et cetera, which helps protect your system. But if you can't scan it, you can't apply quarantine rules, and in most cases, this will fail open. It will act as if that scanning and the quarantine rules, if they aren't even there. So fail open can be good or bad, depending on the application. Fail closed is the opposite, and I like to use air brakes as an example because for no particular reason I have a truck driving license. Um, this is a two-chamber brake where the left one is an emergency brake. And the way this works is when there's air pressure in there, it forces the brake open so it's not applied. And if there's a failure in the chamber or in the airline, the compressor or the tank, the air pressure dissipates and that spring activates and applies the brake. It fails in the on position where it is closed because you cannot use your system anymore. Your brakes are applied permanently until you resolve the issue. 
In software, we see this in something as simple as a consumer router. If you take a hammer to that, or a firmware corruption, or something like that, you're not going to get internet through it anymore. It will fail in the closed position uh, where the system no longer works. Fail over can be described through this beautiful slide from Microsoft that I found when I Googled it. It's pretty straightforward. You have a backup system. That's all that means. You have a backup system that you switch to when there's a problem. And your backup system, as an example, could be a power supply. All right, your mains power fails, you use your generators, and you're up and running again. And what's interesting about failovers, and important to note, is that they don't have to be identical. They can be a different design, a different architecture, as long as they accomplish the same purpose. And that is often uh, something that we would like, that's desirable. If you look at the Ariane 5 example, because those two computers were identical, they both suffered the same failure. But if they had been different architectures or running different code, that issue would not have happened because you wouldn't have the same failure twice. And in software, you can see this in cloud architecture quite often, uh, they get very complicated, active, 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 passive, different multi-cloud systems, whatever you dream you can build. Uh, if you've ever worked with Amazon's US East One region, you know what I'm talking about because that thing fails several times per year and you're practicing these regularly. And then we have fail-safe. And fail-safe is a bit different because it's not a specific mode. A fail-safe can be fail-open, it can be fail-closed, or it can be fail-over. It's whichever is most relevant for safety for your system. So it is a term that can be any depending on what works best for what you're trying to accomplish. So lesson four is to choose the right failure mode for your system. So with a fail safe, which is generally what you want to try to achieve, uh, the, what, which one you choose depends on what you're trying to build. If it's something that is not strictly necessary, if it's there for observability or some extra features or something where you're OK with it not running, then a fail open design is great, because you don't want to shut down your entire production system if some monitoring system breaks for a while. If it manages something dangerous, you want a fail closed design, like those valves on the spacecraft. You want them to fail in a situation where they are not causing problems. And if it's required for operation and you have the budget to have a backup system, a fail over is a great solution whenever you can. But if we look at Gemini 8, our question is, what is the failure mode in that system? And that's where things get a little sticky, because there isn't one system, there isn't one failure mode. It's a combination of different things going on at once. The fuel that is used in those thrusters is called a hypergolic fuel, which means that when two chemicals touch, they spontaneously ignite. And that's great for orbital systems, because you don't want to have to spark and ignite fuel uh, every, for every 50 millisecond thrust burst that you're trying to apply. Now, this fuel, I would argue, is a fail open system, because if your containment system fails, it ignites, right? But the valve that controlled the flow of fuel was an electric solenoid. And this thing only opens to allow fuel through if there's electricity applied to it. So if the, if the electricity stops, it closes. That's a fail closed design. But the system that provided electricity to it, what happened in this case, there was a short circuit that caused electricity to constantly be flowing to that valve, even though there was no control input. So their electrical circuit was a fail open design, which nullified this safety measure as a fail closed design. And so this complex arrangement of different failure modes and systems is really one of the key lessons they took away from this um, near fatal accident, which is that you should never have power on a system unless you want power on that system. And so they rewired the thruster arrangement to work that way instead of failing with the power on. We're not going to talk about two um, other smaller missions that have some relevant and interesting lessons. Not necessarily part of the space race, but definitely what I would call the golden age of space flight, because Voyager 1 was one of the most successful missions that NASA ever launched. So Voyager 1, its objective was to fly by a bunch of the outer planets, take pictures, capture some data, send it back home. It was initiated in the early 1970s when they started designing it and then building it. And during that first decade of work on it, there were thousands, literally thousands of engineers working on that project. Now, in May of 2022, um, just last year, Voyager 1 started sending back some erroneous data from its attitude control system. And in order to find a fix, they had to understand what was actually running on that spacecraft, because 50 years later, none of those engineers were there anymore. And the problem was that they didn't have easy access to the documentation. They didn't have any one manual that included all these different components. And while the engineering team was based at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California, their documentation was not. It was in a warehouse somewhere. Uh, 
somewhere else entirely. And the documentation that was stored wasn't categorized by project, like the Voyager 1 box. It was categorized by the name of the engineer who wrote it. So they had to find the names of every engineer who worked on the project, take their boxes, find the Voyager 1 documents, assemble them, and then they realized a bunch of names are missing. So they had to go door knocking and track down the engineers and their descendants to find the boxes that they took home with them in order to get that documentation. In the words of the project manager, it was a time-consuming process. <laughs> it took them four months to get the documentation assembled so that they could debug that and figure out what the problem was. And that brings us to lesson five, which is to keep your documentation organized. Because we talk a lot about how important it is to comment your code and to document your APIs and your cloud architectures, and that's all true, right? That's all important. But it's all pretty useless if you can't find it when you actually need it. Keeping that accessible, searchable, and organized is just as critical as writing it in the first place. Fortunately, Voyager 1 is still out there. They fixed it. It is still sending back data from interstellar space. Uh, and they had actually had another issue just this summer, but they were able to fix it pretty quickly because now they had all the documentation. And the final one we're going to talk about is the Mars Climate Orbiter, 1999. So this was a space probe that was designed to study the Martian atmosphere and the Martian climate. It was started in 1993, again by JPL, but Lockheed Martin was a subcontractor. And it all went pretty well. It launched, it got to, Earth, uh, to Mars, launched on December 11th, 1998. But on September 23rd of 1999, just as it was coming into Mars, the spacecraft, the communication with it was lost permanently. So to understand what happened, we have to look at the design of the spacecraft. We see it's asymmetrical. Solar panel on one side, but not the other. And in space, we have something called solar wind, which is particles that are ejected from the sun, and they make contact with parts of a spacecraft to apply a force like wind against a sail. And that causes, because it's asymmetrical, that caused the spacecraft to rotate, to shift, and to not follow a perfect flight plan. Now, they knew that this was going to happen, so they had a plan to correct for it. And so Lockheed Martin's job was to write a piece of software that measured these deviations from the intended trajectory and to dump that data to a file. And then JPL software would load that data from the file and use those calculations to determine what the correction burn should look like in order to fix the trajectory. Didn't go as planned. Turns out that the actual values that they should have used were 4.45 times higher than the values that were reported by Lockheed Martin software. And that caused their, or their injection burn to bring them in at an altitude of 57 kilometers instead of 226. 57 kilometers is unfortunately within the atmosphere of Mars, which caused the spacecraft to either burn up as it went behind Mars, or it fried a bunch of electronics, it came slingshotted out the other side back into sun orbit, and we never heard from it again. We're not exactly sure what its fate was, but we definitely know it's not alive. That number, 4.45, is pretty interesting because that happens to be the conversion between pounds force and newtons. NASA had specified that all measurements and all units should be metric SI units for their systems. Lockheed Martin is an American defense contractor that primarily works for the US military. Everything they did, especially at the time, was in imperial units. And so uh, this led to that incorrect calculation with the incorrect burn, which caused it to burn up in Mars' atmosphere. So lesson six is to check your specs. Not just as the provider, right? They should have tested that and verified the units were correct before delivering that to NASA, but also when you're receiving a deliverable. Should have been a little integration testing going on here, perhaps. Because NASA didn't check that either, and they didn't realize that this thing was providing the wrong units. And I can show you what happens when you screw that up. This is a Proton-M rocket launched by Russia in July of 2013. And one of the technicians had installed three of the sensors in the incorrect orientation on the first stage. That caused it to have no yaw control, which led to this. Now, rockets are supposed to be pointy end up as you launch. This one went the wrong way. It's actually pretty impressive that it survived as long as it did, given the flight path but eventually it does break up. And hits the ground. 
rocket explosions are pretty spectacular. Now, had anyone checked that engineer's work? Had anyone inspected the installation? Had anyone um, reviewed what had been done? Had the engineer himself double-checked the specs before installing them? That would have been avoided. Again, no one was on board that, so that's not a big deal, but a lot of money lost. So we can review the lessons we've gone over to summarize. One, humans will make mistakes. As you put them in technological systems, they will always make a mistake eventually. But also, humans can fix things. So it's a delicate balancing act between how much control you give them versus how much control you give the autonomous systems. You need to prioritize your tasks, especially when you have some that are life critical and some that aren't. And you do not want those less important tasks to interfere with the things that are keeping your people alive or your production system running. You want to persist your important data because being able to recover from a failure is essential uh, in any kind of system like this. Choosing the right failure mode is important to ensure that when there is a failure, you're in a relatively safe state and that failure itself is not going to kill your astronauts. You need to keep your documentation organized so that you can access it when you need it, and you need to check your specs. And there's an interesting quote that I want to leave you with. For some time, I thought that Apollo 13 was a failure. I was disappointed I didn't get to land on the moon. But actually, it turned out to be the best thing that could have happened. That was Jim Lovell. I told you his name would come up again. What he's referencing here is that after Apollo 11 and 12, two successful landings on the moon, NASA and the general public started to get a bit complacent, and the astronauts too. Everything is going well, the risks really aren't that bad, and failure doesn't happen. This shocked them out of it. The public started paying more attention. NASA started paying more attention. The astronauts started taking it more seriously because that failure almost killed the entire crew. And that, well, for everyone who's a little upset that I started my lesson indexing with one instead of zero, like a bad computer scientist, I didn't. I just skipped the first one. Lesson zero is learning from your mistakes. One of the things you might have noticed I left out at the beginning when I was talking about commercial providers was SpaceX. And that's because they're followed a bit of a different trajectory than some of the others. They have been very successful from an engineering perspective. Think what you may about their CEO, uh, but the engineering teams are phenomenal. And they've made some pretty amazing accomplishments in this field. And they have done that by being able to blow up a lot of rockets right, through what they call the iterative design process. They try something, it might not work. If it fails, you learn something from it. And that is an excellent approach to learning the weaknesses in your systems. As long as there are no people on board and you can handle the failure, that's fine. Because if you have nothing but time or money or maybe a little prestige to lose, then blowing things up to learn where their weak points are is an excellent approach to making your system more resilient. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. This is my email. Feel free to send me any questions or comments or talk about anything you'd like. And I will be out in the lobby if you want to chat.